Dr. Daniel Cohn is at the cutting edge of athletic performance development. He specializes in neuromuscular screening. He's with us here today as guest lecturer at Satanta College. You're very welcome, Daniel. Thanks for the invitation. Um, Daniel, could you tell us about your current work, where you're working and who you're working with? Um, well, my, my research background and, and um, cons consultory black background is uh, in mainly strength and power evaluation and development. Um, Research-wise, my focus has been in the last, I guess, 10 or 15 years around force platform testing and is isokinetic and force platform testing. Um, latterly, more so in force platform testing as a, as a means to, to evaluate neuromuscular performance in elite performers um, in the training ground. Uh, in situations where other isokinetic dynamometry might not be might not be feasible, um, that's been going on essentially in in pro football, mainly in pro football since since two thousand and two, where um, I uh, did a research project with with um, Dr. Phil Graham Smith, a biomechanist from who's uh, was at Salford now now at aspiring Qatar and. Um, we were looking at force platform measures in uh, Manchester United. Um, we were we what we found is that, that while there was very interesting data being um, being gathered, the uh, the time it took to process that data um, three or four months <laughs> in some due to the volume of it, we tested eighty five players, seven different tests, three different trials. Um, by the time we returned the data, and I say with embarrassment, you know, it was uh, it was took so long to do. The data was the relevance of that data was was really reduced. Obviously, being a pre-season data returned in November. <laughs> um, now, we're, with Dr. Graham Smith, um, um, we we separated ways, if you like. He, he focused on his research in, in Manchester, and I was in London. Um, and independently, we began to look at dual force platform testing. And we met a number of years later, probably 2012 was the next time we met just at the London Olympics and, and realised that the independently what he'd been seeing in, athlete, in, in Olympic athletes or in track and field athletes and rugby players and I'd been seeing in footballers was with the dual platform testing was, was really interesting and de deserved uh, more attention but we, we also f needed a way to speed up that process of, of, of evaluating. And Could you tell us a little bit about what exactly is a dual force plate? Right, rate? of course. So essentially you've got two platforms which left and right are used and, and you can do the same tests that you might do on a single platform so uh, isometric mid thigh pull counter movement jump squat jump what you're suddenly getting is not only the total output that you the, the, the classic measures of jump height and peak power and mean power etc um, peak force um, you're suddenly getting individual limb data but you're also getting the asymmetries both during the takeoff and the landing phase, and it's those asymmetries which, in, in particularly in terms of a rehab, return to play, and maybe injury risk screening, um, both in the takeoff and the landing phase are, are proving to be uh, very interesting and opening a, a new, if you like, a new level of intelligence around athlete monitoring that we didn't we didn't really have before. So, <coughs> before we move into what that means. Mm for the strength conditioning practitioner. Can you just explain that, or if I might summarize, 2012, you uh, devised dual plates, mm. and now they're at an advanced stage, yes. and correct me if I'm wrong, that are not just used in biomechanical lab laboratories. For example, we have a number of plates here in our facility, mm. and we use them daily uh, right. to evaluate athlete performance. Mm. So can you tell us a bit about the development of that and yeah. where they are now in f for usage 
with the ordinary sprint condition yeah. practitioner. Well, you, you, you mentioned the, the laboratory situation and, and obviously platforms, platforms have been in labs for decades. Um, I guess what, what we've done and we've developed with, with Forstex, which is a, a company that um, I'm scientific advisor to and as is Phil in the biomechanics, is to, is to really take these, this equipment from the laboratory and bring it into the training ground or the gym can still be used in a lab situation, but the idea is to is to enable practitioners, S and C practitioners, physios, therapists, to interpret data, to gather data rapidly, and and implement that in terms of um, informing their training programs. So, as a result, I mean, within when we we work to develop some some quite robust platforms for EIS English Institute of Sport. Um, and they are in several of the EIS sites and they will be rolled out across EIS um, up to Rio and beyond. Um, but they are in, in places like in Arsenal Football Club at Manchester United, um, Everton, Sevilla in Spain, Atletico Madrid, and then in, in rugby, Saracens, uh, Australian Rugby Sevens, and now we're moving into Aussie Rules, which is very exciting, and in ice hockey as well, Montreal Canadiens. So these are all team sport situations where they're testing a large number of athletes and they're doing it on a regular basis. And this, this system, this uh, software-hardware combination allows them to, to do that or supports that and enables regular testing. Okay, um, so, sorry, Daniel. <coughs> yeah. I'm very impressed with the simplicity at which mm. The software is uh, the simplicity of software, uh, but how impressive it is in, in providing information. Can you tell us about what you're looking at in terms of the outputs from from the four decks and how useful they are for monitoring athletes? Well, the I guess the the output comes into three interrelated categories. One is your your classic training adaptations, strength and power training adaptations, whether it's peak force, peak power, um, rate of force development, time to peak force, those, those uh, measures of what you'd hope to see in, in, a, in a good power training program, for example. Um, the second aspect is, is, again, related to that, but is, is the idea of introducing strength and power testing or those same measures whether it be isometric or jump testing in a regular on a regular basis post two days post match for example to establish the degree of fatigue of neuromuscular fatigue often in those same parameters that you'd measure periodically to measure training adaptations so you're looking at the sharpness or the you know those characteristics of the of the athlete that you'd hope to see improve during training programs and you want to see that they don't they aren't deteriorating dramatically through through the season and the third aspect is is in rehabilitation um, is to improve the objectivity of return to play markers and to evaluate progress in in rehab and apart again from the classic strength and power measures there are a number of interesting novel parameters both bilateral and asymmetry, particularly for myself, my interest as fascination or even verging on obsession has been the uh, the landing forces and how they may be an indicator of um, compensatory strategies or or the, or the desire of the nervous system to offload load on landing, which on landing is four or five times body mass onto the away from the involved side, and that that could be an indicator of um, if you like rehab progress as they are able to take increased load on on the involved side this so you know you're now entering into a fascinating area which is now bringing from the laboratory into the practice area yeah. the ability to be able to monitor key metrics or measurements <coughs> that relate specifically not just to recovery from play yeah. and readiness to play but also areas where we were lacking before, convenient measures of symmetry and balance in rehabilitation and recovery from injury. Mm. Could you explain some more about that? I think for me what's exciting in this area is, is this is 
the area where strength and conditioning professionals get involved and cross over with the medical area. And so it's at that point in late stage rehab where you, you want to understand the effectiveness of these of these programs, of these strength and conditioning programs. Um, what we're finding is that, for example, the development or the progression in, for example, jump height or power measured bilaterally may be very good. And indeed, the asymmetries in force production may also be heading in the right di direction. Um, and that is total force production. What we're seeing when we, when we do some analysis, for example, particularly of the landing phase, and particularly post ligament injury, cruciate ligament and, and ankle, inju ankle ligament injury, but also some other types of knee, knee ligaments and cartilage injury, is a, a, a massive, I say massive, 40 to 50% asymmetries in the landing phase and we need to remember that the the athletes are being told to do a maximal counter movement vertical jump they're not being told their 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 landing is being evaluated they're focused on producing a good vertical performance the these kind of um, these kind of asymmetries are presumed to be some sort of compensatory strategy to, to offload the involved side. Um, and what we now, if you like, opening up uh, a layer of, of intelligence on the neuromuscular system, which by asking them to do, a bi by, by forcing them to do a bilateral landing, you're, you're allowing the nervous system to, be, to select the way it loads and the way it distributes load. Remember, we're looking at four to five times body weight sometimes on landing. So this is a kind of load that even in an eccentric test you're 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 not getting. So you're putting the you're putting the system under quite heavy load. You're asking the question, and we're seeing that the progression in in landing force asymmetry may be far behind what you would hope to see. And and I say that because asymmetries in, for example, in in a elite football population in, in landing is, is maybe between 10 to 12 percent in a, in a, in a healthy pre-season screen. Um, so we're talking two, three standard deviations away from that. Whatever, you, whatever cut point you choose, it's, it's extreme. Um, this type of evaluation with, a sing, with just with essentially a left and right um, vertical force evaluation, we, we're getting information that Otherwise, you would need three-dimensional kinematics. You would need inverse dynamics. And while these values do not tell you necessarily where in the in which at which joint or how they're compensating, within a, a test that you know, say three trials, thirty seconds, you're getting information that there is compensatory strategies going on, interlimb compensatory strategies. The next step is to is to further evaluate where in the in the kinetic chain they are and indeed they may be above the pelvis it may be to do with core 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 stability issues or it, you know th this is it doesn't take the work away but it, it it gives you a red flag and we've seen many times very good progression in the bilateral even on pitch you know velocities sprint speed straight line running and they've gone and been tested on the platform and, and in, in, in specific cases that those test results have averted an increase in load in those play, in, in players which then may have caused more damage where they've had a, where, where they've had a, a, a joint issue. So I think that's very important that we, we, we can only manage what we measure. Um, and the other thing that's important is that it's, a, it's the same test. So we're not asking the athlete to do more tests. Mm -hmm. It becomes the responsibility <coughs> of, the, of the software and the, the professional to get more out of the same test rather than ask athletes to then do this and this test. And, you know, I'm not against, as a sports scientist, obviously I'm never against testing. I like testing. But I think what we need to try and do is... is we throw away too much of the data from, from, from a jump. We've got eccentric phase, we've got concentric phase, we've got landing. There's a lot more to be learnt from those force time profiles, but we have to make it 
easy to to capture and we have to get these algorithm engines which we're developing under the bonnet to do that work and to highlight where where there are issues within this forced time Very curve. Good. So what you're <clears throat> to summarize that it's now available the duals platform yeah. to assess asymmetries but in particular landing loads mm -hmm. that may indicate normally a 10 maybe 15 percent differential in healthy athletes mm. But what you're seeing now, you're getting three to four times that difference or difference yeah. taking place. And this now, what can the practitioner do? I know you've touched on it there at the end of, of your last comment. What can he do or she do to progress that, in other words, to help the rehabilitation process? This is this I guess is the is the the future research question because although for example we we've done work on total landing forces and we implemented an intervention just around core stability training particularly static core stability training which resulted in reduced peak landing forces and there's a lot of work from from tim hewitt's group around uh, around this similar idea of, of core and trunk stability being involved in, and even mm. technique being involved in, in peak landing force. There isn't anything at the moment um, around asymmetries in that and how those are specifically resolved. Now that may be, it, it would make sense that partly this is to do with ensuring that there's sufficient work, unilateral work on, on landing control. Um, and that's a different kind of sort of effort than, than essentially just improving strength. Um, so okay, so interestingly you touched on a, on a very important point there. So helping to improve or reduce the imbalance in landing and in the way the athlete lands may not be related to strength training per se, it may be related to maybe something more up along the chain like core and stability development. Quite possibly, very yes. Yeah. Yet to be undertaken yeah. research and confirmed. Sure. And uh, and the other thing to say is is that essentially where where asymmetries are are, are occurring or, or increasing even through rehab is often whereby the additional height that the athlete is jumping from when they're when they're improving their jump height through rehab, what's happening is that the the involved side isn't getting worse in terms of its amount of loading. So it's still loading 1500 newtons but what's happening is an additional load due to the higher landing height and that additional load for some reason is not being accepted by the uh, the uh, involved side so the additional load is going to the uh, to the contralateral side that um, is the non-injured the non-injured <coughs> side and the concern as well in the future research is and we we've seen case studies where there's consequences of that have been or at least we believe a consequence because there's been sort of temporal link between that and for example a contralateral ACL um, rupture um, but this can also affect the biomechanics in such a way as to influence m other injuries on, on the contralateral side or, or on the same side in other joints. Very interesting Daniel. One final question. Taking all this, um, can the practitioner acquire this forced X? How easy it is? Where will they go? And is there a, a, um, an opportunity for some upskilling in how to use it and how to apply it into their normal practice? Yeah, I mean, I think we, I think as a, as an S and C um, professional, every the, the tests themselves are, 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 they'll be absolutely familiar with. Obviously, that you know the Bosco profiling though know, within that the counter movement, the squat jump, single leg jumps, um, and then the isometric test, um, the we certainly through Satanta College have been upskilling or skilling it through the, the undergraduate and the master's program. I've been doing doing lectures on that. We um, we we provide as a I guess there's two routes to to accessing this type of technology. Um, one is through these very robust um, Platforms that we that we designed essentially for EIS, which are um, still cheaper than a single, um, if you like, brand 
platform that you you know you're, you're familiar with in the laboratory, but they only have a single axis, which we find is adequate in for 95 percent of the of the 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 um, the testing that people are interested in in the SNC environment. The other one is the uh, combination of the same software processing system, but with smaller platforms, um, less robust and, and have some limitations. And those are the uh, the Pasco platforms. Um, um, <clears throat> finally, just to wrap up, the future. What what do you see as the future from your own point of view and your research? Where 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 is it taking you now? Well, I think th there's I guess two key areas with, within within the platform monitoring. Um, one is the what we've noticed is within what we might expect to be a homogeneous group, say, of, of elite outfield footballers, that the recovery profiles and the particular parameters which are stable and less stable in those athletes may vary. So what, what we're interested in is, is why is it that, for example, in one player, the duration, the duration of their concentric part of, the, of, their, of their jump is extremely stable and on another player performing the same type of training load it, it fluctuates very dramatically so I think it's understanding the the fingerprint if you like a, a kind of fatigue recovery fingerprint if it's if if an athlete does have that and that's fairly um, if you like repeated over time and we should be monitoring these three things in, in this athlete and monitoring these five in, in another athlete. I think that's that's important. We need to combine the monitoring research with the training load research. So, you know, these are on, some ongoing projects indeed here. There's one, one research project going on of that type with training load being monitored as well as neuromuscular performance. So looking at the input and the output and how that changes, how that differs between players and how that differs in the same player over time. Fantastic um, Daniel, what you're, what you're just describing is the ability to be able to look much closer at key, perhaps very key important metrics mm. using the four sticks but other monitoring systems like workload monitoring using yeah. GPS yeah, systems. Yeah, exactly. So this really is, is yeah. what you're saying, there is a need to be able to have these units to be able to talk to each other Absolutely. and to integrate them into into a package, so to yeah. speak. I believe that's where your 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 work is taking you as well. But also tell me finally about your <clears throat> your potential linking um, with other uh, pieces of kit and that. So we got GPS and Force Dex linking. Is there any other potential that you see is on the horizon? Um. I mean, I would like to see where, where we'd like to go is, is to somehow integrate um, at least very simple videography into, as a, as, as a kind of standard, into the, the, the software system. And, and to be able to review once you see th things of interest, things that of note in the force time curve, in the kinetic side, that you could then review at this particular time point what's going on across the joints. I think that would be, you know, in the same vein as a very cheap addition to the system. Um, it'd be very nice to see the the interrelationship between the, the kinetics in, in, in more detailed um, marker systems like organic motion or, or, or marker systems. But I think what we need to, do, our focus has been to try and uh, make these things accessible in terms of accessing and interpreting data, but also price-wise, because if you have the budget to have a biomechanics lab, then you know you might choose um, to have the whole kinematic and inverse dynamics, and and that's you know that's great. But what we're really trying to focus on is is simple, simple okay, measures. Okay, so keeping it simple for the practitioner, the strength and conditioning yeah. coach. So it sounds like <clears throat> must-haves in the future are going to be a pair of four sticks which can assess bilateral individual limb mm -hmm. balances and perhaps GPS units that are yeah. going to help with monitoring workload. Yeah. Um, so well, look, Daniel, this has been very interesting and I thank you very much. You'll be back again with Satanta College 
delivering more and more of your findings <laughs> and we're, we're looking I forward to so. that. So Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you.